network analysis. So, why use networks? Well, networks uh, is a natural way of representing data when you really want to emphasize the relationship and the interaction between different points of data. Some instances where this is uh, used in biology realm is protein-protein interaction networks. Uh, that's an example when you really want to emphasize more the relationship between different proteins than the qualities of the proteins itself. Another thing is gene regulatory networks where you want to emphasize the interaction between genes and proteins that are regulating the expression of those genes. And another example is gene co-expression network, where really there's not a interaction itself, but it's more a relationship, where genes are associated with co-expression. And so we come to network analysis. And these networks, they have been studied in many different realms of science for very long, and some very clever people come came up with some very nice way of describing uh, networks and their properties in both a quantitative and qualitative uh, way and develop tools for that. So network analysis really gives you a toolbox when you want to study these interactions between its different components. So let's describe a network. As you've seen now, this thing that has been accompanying us for a few slides on the right, it's a network. And you can see number there. There are the components that we want to represent. And they have uh, some lines between them, which represents their interactions. Uh, the components in the network terminology are either called nodes or vertices. And the interactions, they are either called links or edges. And together, they either form a network or a graph. And here, I have to apologize for the confusion. This is my cause. But it has been something that's been uh, around for many, many years. So the terminology itself is either links and nodes form a network or vertices and edges form a graph, but they can really be used interchangeably. There might be occasions when you would want to represent interactions that are not symmetric. That is, if A is associated with B, B has not the same association with A. And this, for this, you use a, you use a directed network. As you see now, our net original network has been changed slightly and the edges now have directions. And the directions represent the way in which the interaction is performed. Now, you might even have two links now between two nodes, each going, for instance, from A to B and one another one going through from B to A, and they have different properties and thus you can represent a non-symmetric interaction. Finally, as we are building our network, uh, I have to explain that both the nodes and the edges, they can have any amount of attributes. And these attributes can be used on any of the algorithms we can discuss. But there is, however, one of the most useful ones, which is the edge weights. And the edge weights themselves represents the strength of the interaction between each and every node. And this, again, will be used by many of the algorithms we will discuss. Now, let's have a look at some of these powerful tools we've been talking about. But first, I would uh, borrow some example here from the Barabasi book and uh, show you these three different networks. One is a computer network. The other is a network of actors that are linked by co-starring on movies. And the other one is a protein-protein interaction network. Now, as you see here, all these networks look the same and they will be uh, having the same properties and whatever algorithm you use on them, you get the same results. But those results have to be interpreted in a very different way for each of these networks. That is, don't trust the results blindly, always remember what the network is representing and then interpret the results on this context. Uh, even for a very good results of your algorithm, if the network is ill-constructed, the results will also not be very useful. Having had that word of caution, let's proceed to the first useful tool. Uh, let's describe what the node degree is. So basically the node degree is a node property and the degree itself is simply the number of edges that it has. Uh, on an undirected network, this is straightforward. In a directed network, you have in degree and out degree, which as the name suggests, tells you the number of edges there are coming in to the node and the number of edges that are going out of the node. The degree of a node is not very useful on its own, but once you start to look at the distribution of degrees over the whole network, then that becomes a different story. 
One of the first things you want to do when faced with a network that you don't know the structure of is look at the degree distribution of the nodes. And that will give you some glimpse of how the network will gen be generated. For instance, if you have a lot of nodes with few degrees, uh, with a very small degree, for instance one or two edges, and you have a small number of nodes with a very high degrees with a lot of edges leading into it, then that's a sign that the network could be generated by preferential attachment. That is, the probability of a node having a link uh, to it, it's proportional to the amount of links that it already has. Uh, that's, for instance, a uh, property that social network exhibits. Next, we have paths. Paths has a very simple definition, and that is the collection of edges that connects two vertices together. And that can perform in any manner. You can also have a trail, which is connecting two edges together, but not repeating any edge or vertices. Now, we can also define the length of a path as the number of edges it contains. And having that, we can define the shortest path between two nodes as the path of all possible paths that has the smallest length. But now to land in something concrete, if you ever used Google Maps to figure out how to go from one place to the other and you wanted to do this in the shortest way possible, well, basically what it's doing is it's calculating a shortest path using the same algorithms that are developed for networks. And basically it treats the whole road network as one network. You have you ask for your starting node, for instance here SciLife Lab, and I want to go to KTH library. So what it does is basically using this road network calculates the shortest path and displays it to me. Now, back to the abstract again. We have a few definitions that use the concept of paths, and the first in our list is the diameter of the network. And that's the property of the network itself, and, and tells you, given all the shortest paths on the network, uh, that is, the shortest path that connects any two nodes in the network, give me the one that has the highest length. And basically, it's returning the two nodes that are the furthest apart in the network and the distance between them. And that's how it relates to the diameter of a circle. Now, another concept is the average shortest path. Uh, that's basically calculating all the shortest paths on the network between any two nodes and averaging them out. And if you all heard of the seven degrees of separation in social network, well, that's a good example of average shortest path. It's just telling you that the average shortest path on the social network is seven. Uh, next, we have cycles. Well, cycles, as the name suggests, starts and ends at the same node, and it's a path that doesn't use the same edge or node twice. And a tree. Well, a tree, we all seen this hierarchical trees or, 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 or this kind of trees, and it's a special case of a graph that doesn't contain any cycle. It is not always the case that two nodes on the network have to have a path between them. Since the network is representing the interaction, if there's no interaction between them, there's no edge, and sometimes if there's no edge, there's no path. As you can see, for instance, here on the right, this is a protein-protein interaction network, and you do have in the middle a very large set of nodes, which all have paths between them, but you do also have in the bottom some nodes that are not linked to any other nodes in the network, or they're linked to a very smaller subset of nodes. Uh, we now define then connected components as a very as the largest set of nodes that you can find that all have paths between them. And a network ha can have numeral connected components. Now let's discuss the concept of cliques. A well, clique is basically a set of nodes in the network where every node inside that set is connected to every other node inside the set. For instance, is your favorite network here on the right, you can see that 5, 2, and 1 form a clique. That is, all those elements are connected to all the other elements. Well, why then we say maximum clique? Well, you can realize that any subset of a clique will also be a clique. So it makes sense to define the maximum clique as a clique that is not a subset of any other larger clique. And that's what you want to find in your network. Also, maximum, net, maximum cliques have to have more than two nodes, because otherwise that's just cheating. And now we come to one of the most convoluted concepts in networks, which is the clustering coefficient. Well, I'm not going to go into much detail on how the clustering coefficient is calculated. I'm just going to tell you that it's a property of a node, of a single node. 
and it varies from 1 to 0. It also tells you how well the neighborhood of the node is, is connected among itself. So for instance, you can see there in the leftmost graph, the purple node and the neighborhood of the purple node is the yellow nodes, and all the yellow nodes are connected among themselves. That means that the clustering coefficient of the purple node is 1. The opposite, on the leftmost network, we can see that all the neighbors of the purple node are not connected among themselves. That means the clustering coefficient of the purple node there is 0. And on the middle, we have a middle term where there's some of the connections are present and some are not, and we have half of the clustering coefficient. Well, let's go into some fun algorithms. There may come a time on your research when you have a network and you want to inspect all the nodes on that network, but you want to do so in a structured way. Well, then you might want to use one of these two graph traversal algorithms. On here, you see displayed the same network twice, but on the right, you have your breadth first search algorithm and numbered are the order in which the nodes are visited. And on the left, you have your depth first search algorithm. Well, you can see that they both pretty much respect their names and depth first search algorithm. You start in your given node and you visit one, the first, uh, neighbor of that node, and then you visit the first neighbor of that second node, and so on. And when you can't um, go deeper, you come back, and then you visit the second neighbor of your previous node, and so forth. On the breadth first search, you just visit all the neighbors of the first node, and then, then you go to all the neighbors of the first neighbor of that node, and so on, and so forth, until you visit all the nodes. There are basically only two ways of just visiting all the nodes and the network in a structured way. Well now, the minimum spanning tree. Well, the minimum spanning tree is basically a tree that connects all the nodes in a network with the minimum of amount of links possible. And in the figure here, you can see the minimum spanning tree for this network. And remember now when I said the edge, the edge weights can play a big effect on the algorithms, well here, it's not actually just returning the the tree which uh, connects all the nodes with the least amount of edges possible, but also if you sum up all the weights, that's what's minimum about this tree. And why is it a tree? Well, you can clearly see that if there was any cycle on this uh, network, then one of the links will be redundant, and you can just remove that and have an even smaller tree. So that's why it always returns a tree. And lastly, I want to spend some time talking to you about community structures in network. Well, a community is loosely defined in a network as a collection of nodes. They're very highly densely connected among themselves, but not so connected to the rest of the network. And is the network equivalent of clustering, if you're talking of traditional multidimensional data? Well, you probably realize by now that there's a lot of definitions of clustering, and as such, there's also a lot of definitions of community in networks. And as I go through now a few algorithms to detect communities in networks, I ask you to remember that each, co each algorithm treats communities in a different way, and as such, it's going to come up with different results. And again, you have to interpret results by the lights and the context of the algorithms that generated it. And the first thing you might ask me is, why not just perform traditional clustering on the nodes of the network? Well, first we would start by needing to define a measure of similarity between the nodes of the network. And well, why not just use distance as we do in usual clustering? Well, the thing is, we did talk about distance between nodes in the network. But to embed them in a multidimensional manner in which all the distance between all the nodes are preserved, in theory you would probably need as many uh, dimensions as you have data points. And then you probably know by now that performing clustering in a very highly dimensional data, it's always going to be a problem. So traditional clustering is very ill uh, posed for this kind of networks. We now then come to one of the first algorithms for detecting communities and also one of the simplest ones. You have to ask it to divide the network into a certain number of communities. And after you do so, you'll try to divide the network in 
as many equal parts as possible, that is containing as many nodes as possible, and where also the separation between these nodes, or what is called the cut, passes through the least amount of edges possible. Or if you are in a weighted network, where the sum of the weights of the edges is as minimum as possible. You can see there in the picture two cuts, the green and the red cut. The green cut only passes through two nodes, uh, two edges, and the red cut passes through three edges. And this would be the results of performing a min cut algorithm in that network. And the next algorithm we're going to see is based on something called edge betweenness. And the edge betweenness is a property of a node, and the intuition is that if a node is between two communities, then a lot of the shortest paths of the network itself is going to pass through that node. And then by removing that node, we are then separating communities. And again, I'm not going to go into details on how the algorithm itself is performed. I'm just going to say that the intuition behind it is that the, the nodes with a lot of shortest paths are separating communities. Another way of separating communities is based on the concept of modularity. And again, you can read the details on the book, and I'm just going to go over the intuitions here. And the intuition here is that the connections inside the community are not random. That is, if the network was connected just at random, there would be no communities. And the modularity is a measure of uh, calculating the fraction that you connections inside a community over the fraction that you would expect if it was at random. And again, uh, here the algorithm would just separate the network into communities in a way that maximizes this measure of modularity. One last community detection algorithm I want to talk to you about is the label propagation algorithm. This is a very fast algorithm and therefore can, apply, can be applied to very large networks. And the caveat is that it has some stochastic uh, procedures on it that makes it not return a unique solution every time you run it. You start the algorithm by assigning labels to nodes you think belong to different communities. The algorithm then assigns random labels to all the other nodes in the network, but then starts to reassign those labels according to the following procedure. Look at all the neighbors of the node and reassign the label to the node you're looking at uh, by the majority vote. Or that is, the node here belongs to the community where the most neighbors belongs to and run this for every node multiple times until the network converges. And those, of course, are only a few examples of community detection algorithms. As I told you before, all the different algorithms have different definitions of what a community is, and even algorithms that have the same definition of what community is, they have different ways of trying to arrive at that definition. I would then point you to this paper, which is comparing a few different community detection algorithms. And they come up with this graph, which you see here, with a few recommendations. On the x-axis, you see a measure of how the, commu uh, the communities are mixed inside the network, or that is, how easy it is to separate them or not. And on the y-axis, you see the amount of uh, nodes in the network. As you might realize, some network detection algorithms are much more easy to calculate than others, and therefore the number of nodes in the uh, network really influences which kind of network detection algorithm you can use. Uh, I, I uh, advise you to read the paper and see for yourself uh, if you ever want to apply this on one of your projects. Thank you for watching this far, and I hope this is somehow useful in your future projects.